Be gator safe. Don't go in the water. Alright, we're here in South Carolina. We're just going to do a quick walk around our condo and see what different kind of bird species we can find. Our condo was in prime birding real estate just a quarter mile from the ocean and surrounded by patches of trees and small bodies of water. One of the best parts about birding in a different state is the chance to see interesting species that are rare in the northern states simply by going for a walk. We had just went outside when we heard the distinctive call of South Carolina's state bird, the Carolina wren. The Carolina wren is a warm weather bird that doesn't normally move into areas where cold temperatures occur. As a result, they can occasionally be found in the northern part of the country, but not with great regularity. They flourish in the southern U.S. As previously mentioned, Carolina wrens can be identified by their boisterous song. Unlike some other wren species, only the male Carolina wren sings. It is estimated that some males sing as many as 3,000 times a day. Males and females may form a pair at any point during the year and mate for life, normally staying in the same territory year-round. Perhaps it was just because of how vocal the runs were, but it seemed like they were everywhere. Another frequent find around the condos were the Carolina chickadees. Carolina chickadees look almost identical to black-capped chickadees with the exception of some subtle details, such as the Carolina chickadee being slightly smaller and having a slight gray wash on their cheeks. The best way to tell the two apart is by knowing their range as the two species don't coexist in most states. The black-capped chickadee is generally a northeastern species while the Carolina chickadee is a southeastern species. The next best way to tell the two species apart is by call, as the Carolina chickadees have a slightly different song than their northern cousins. In winter, Carolina chickadees live in small flocks and defend their territories from other chickadees. Most birds in the flock will stay with the same group all season. However, some birds will switch between flocks and may continue switching back and forth the rest of the year, having different social ranks in each hierarchy. Carolina chickadees may stay together subsequent years after mating. Whether the pair will bond for longer than just one season seems to depend on specific populations along with the previous year's success. Along with the wrens and chickadees were several other common springtime migrants, including ruby-crowned kinglets, white-throated sparrows, and blue-gray gnatcatchers. Yellow-rumped warblers also made a brief appearance and seemed to be more accommodating to our viewing. Some other familiar birds that live all across the eastern half of the country were also present. Northern cardinals are a common feeder bird up north and were just as plentiful around the condos. The cardinal's cheery song is sung by both males and females, something unusual for North American songbirds. Along with the cardinals, the song of the tufted titmouse could also be heard frequently. The tufted titmouse is a favorite of feeder watchers due to their curious nature and cute appearance. While they were plentiful, the tufted titmouse is extremely elusive and therefore very difficult to catch a glimpse of. Overhead, two species of vultures circled. South Carolina has the turkey vulture, which can be found anywhere in the continental United States, and the black vulture, which is a year-round resident in the southern U.S., but is extremely rare in the north. Black vultures can be identified by their dark head and light patches on the wingtips, which the turkey vultures lack. Walking around the condos, we came upon several small bodies of water, which were almost always filled with reptiles. One of the most plentiful species was the yellow-bellied slider. Yellow-bellied sliders were once the most commonly sold turtles in the pet trade. They are very social creatures and inhabit freshwater ponds, marshes, and rivers in the southeastern United States. These turtles seemed to be begging for food as they came close to the shore to greet us. Standing on the bank for just a few seconds seemed to gather the turtles in front of us. Throwing some grass in the water brought the turtles even closer until we were able to catch some of them. Who knew it would be that easy? It wasn't. We've been at this for hours. Yeah, but like once you just <laughs> toss some grass in the water, People obviously feed these and then they've gotten used to it. You want to let them go? Yep. There he goes. He's a little indignant about the process. Good catch. While catching the turtles, we were constantly on the lookout for a less friendly creature that also resides in the same waters, the American alligator. American alligators start to become active in early spring, and we did happen to encounter one swimming lazily down a creek. 
Alligators are highly sensitive to changes in the hydrology, salinity, and productivity of their environment, making them an important indicator of an ecosystem's health. While small alligators normally pose little threat to humans, larger gators have been known to attack and in some instances kill people. Due to this fact, we had to be incredibly vigilant near the water's edge to avoid a more personal encounter. Along with the reptiles, several bird species were also patrolling the ponds and canals. An eastern Phoebe sat near a house waiting for insects to come close enough to chase, and a belted kingfisher flew back and forth, occasionally resting on overhanging trees. One of our favorite finds was an anhinga hunting in one of the larger ponds. Anhingas are freshwater diving birds similar in size and shape to double-crested cormorants. They typically live in shallow, slow-moving bodies of water, where they search for small to medium-sized fish. They're known for using their sharp bill to spear their prey, as this one did. This habit suggests that they ambush their prey as opposed to chasing it. As a result of their diving habits, they can be seen sitting on branches near the water with wings open, facing the sun to dry off. They're excellent flyers and can even soar overhead similar to vultures. They're a very versatile species of bird. On the way back, we encountered a few of the more colorful birds in the area. Cedar waxwings gathered in bushy foliage and a pair of eastern bluebirds watched from the trees above. We were lucky enough to get a glimpse of a barred owl, which was unfortunately being harassed by crows and blue jays. As quickly as it arrived, it took off and we went back inside after a productive walk. The wildlife on Hilton Head Island has grown used to living near people, which allows for close-up views of otherwise elusive creatures. It's always nice when you don't have to go very far to find interesting, cooperative animals. Just another day of birding in South Carolina. Join us again next time on Badgerland Birding. Oh, boo.